So based, based on the source of electromagnetic radiation, we can classify remote sensing into two groups. That is passive remote sensing and active remote sensing. Passive remote sensing is where sensors detect, measure, and record the energy that is naturally available. That is energy that is reflected by surface features. And that energy is the incident energy is from the sun. And then when we look at active remote sensing, this is where sensors emit their own radiation and then detect whatever is reflected, okay? So here you can see, this here is passive remote sensing. As you can see, the source of electromagnetic radiation is the sun. So as it reaches the earth, it is either absorbed, reflected, transmitted. So the sensor on the satellite will record whatever is reflected. And then uh, we have active remote sensing where the satellite itself produces the electromagnetic energy or the radiation. And then it is targeted to the earth and then the sensor will record whatever is reflected. So an example of uh, passive remote sensing satellites or sensors is uh, Landsat. And that is what we are going to look at, okay? So an understanding of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum will be very important for this, for this particular webinar. I believe we have interacted with the electromagnetic spectrum. The human eye can only perceive the visible light. That is from the violet all the way to red. Now sensors come in handy when we need to detect and record infrared, uh, microwaves, and radio waves, uh, including all the other radi uh, radiations like gamma rays and ultraviolet. Landsat 8 uh, was launched in 11, on 11th February 2013 and it carries two sensors. That is the OLI, Operational Land Imager, and the Thermal Infrared Sensor. Uh, the Operational Land Imager measures the visible and near infrared and the shortwave infrared portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, its images have a 15 meter panchromatic and a 30 meter multispectral spatial re uh, resolution. That's worth of 185 kilometers. And then the thermal infrared sensor measures land surface temperatures in two thermal bands. The TIRS has a swath of 185 kilometers still, but the resolution changes. It's now 100 meters. So these are the bands for the OLI sensor. Uh, when you download your image, you'll get 11, 11 images. So with the naming, you'll, you'll notice that we have B1 to B11. Uh, so the first band is the coastal blue or coastal aerosol or ultra blue, uh, these are the specifics, including the wavelength and the resolution. Band two is blue, band three is green, four red, five near infrared, six is shortwave infrared one, seven is shortwave infrared two, eight is panchromatic, and nine is the Cyrus band. So each of these bands have particular uses, uh, which I have stated in the next slide. 
So the coastal blue is used for coastal and aerosol studies. Blue is for bathymetric mapping. By bathymetric, I mean the studying the flow of the oceans and water bodies. Distinguishing soil from vegetation and deciduous from coniferous vegetation. The green band emphasizes peak vegetation, which is useful for assessing plant figure. The red band is used to discriminate vegetation slopes. The near infrared band for emphasizing biomass content and shorelines. Short wave infrared one uh, discriminates moisture content of soil and vegetation. It also penetrates thin clouds. Short wave infrared two for improved moisture content of soil and vegetation. And it also penetrates thin clouds. The panchromatic band, like you have noticed, it has a higher spatial resolution. So it is used for sharper image definition. And then we have band nine, the Cyrus band, which is used to improve detection of Cyrus cloud contamination. I will share these slides. So when we move to the TIR sensor, like I said, it only has two bands, that is the TIRS1 and TIRS2. Band 10 and 11, both for thermal mapping and for soil, for estimated soil moisture. So when you download your Landsat image, you'll get a, a file with a very long name. And I would like us to look at the that naming convention, what it would mean. I had shared a link to help show those who do not know how to download Landsat images so that we can flow together. So please take a look at that. So when you get your Landsat image, let me switch to another. So your Landsat images will look like this. You'll get a folder with the very many images that is from band one to band 11. And you notice that it has a very long name. So those, those figures there inside the name have meanings, which you will look at. So the first L there would stand for Landsat. Usually it is followed by the sensor. So it's either LC, LT, or LO, or LE, depending on the sensor. For Landsat 8, it only has two sensors. That is the TIRS sensor and the OLI. If you downloaded based on the tutorial, you'll notice that the naming has LC, meaning that you get both sensors. And then SS for distinguishing from Landsat 1 to all the way to Landsat 9. For this particular tutorial, you'll see it's LC08. Okay, so it's Landsat with combined sensors and it's Landsat 8. Yeah, and then after LC08, you get something like uh, LITP or LIGT or LIGS, which is the processing correction level. For ours, it is LITP, which is precision and terrain. And then it will be followed by the path and row, then acquisition date, processing date, collection number, and the collection category. Some image properties that you need to consider when you're downloading your, your satellite images is the spatial resolution, and that will be the, the size of one single grid cell. For Landsat 8, 
band one all the way to band seven is 30 meters. Like we had seen earlier, from band one to band seven, we have a resolution of 30 meters, and then the panchromatic becomes 15. The Cyrus band becomes 30. Then we have the TIRS one and two, which have the spatial resolution of 100 meters. So that is one thing that you need to consider. A higher value for spatial resolution indicates a lower resolution. And then a lower value indicates higher resolution. For example, the panchromatic band here has a lower value. Yes, but now it means it has a higher resolution because one grid, the grid size is smaller than the others. So it gives a higher resolution. Another property you need to consider is the temporal resolution. That is the time or frequency that data is collected as well as the availability of historical images. For Landsat, I think it's 16 days, the frequency. And then we have a spectral resolution. That is the part of the electromagnetic spectrum for which measurements are made. Then we have the radiometric resolution. That is the sensor sensitivity and the ability to measure small differences. Other issues that you need to consider include cloud cover. A good image has, a, has lower cloud cover. So for this webinar, we will be looking at R for remote sensing. And you can perform many tasks with R like creating color composites, stacking images, plotting spectral profiles, image classification, machine learning for the purpose of creating predictive models and some analysis. I will show you an example. So here I have a code for supervised classification done with R. Uh, it was Nakuru, I think. Let me see if I have the output image. So the code that you see there produced this output for supervised classification. So that's one thing you can do with R. Uh, another one. This is a model. This is called to create a model that can predict biomass from satellite images. I'm not going to go into the details. And then you also have uh, this one here. It's a regression model applied for remote sensing. Uh, for this webinar, we look uh, at image classification. But uh, before we do that, we'll go step by step. I'm working under the assumption that you already have R installed in your system. We will be using R Studio. And the packages that you are going to use is Rasta and uh, Rasta VIS. When you get to supervised classification, 
will have more as the more packages so like you can see here we have up to 13 packages that we can use but for the basics we'll have we'll use only rasta and rasta vis so for those that do not know how to install packages or in r so if you open r it will look like this you will get a view it, when you open r studio it will look like this so this is the console yeah uh, these are your environment variables and then here you can look at plots packages files and sometimes view to view maps or uh, plotted diagrams so you can install packages here if you have r studio you can install by clicking this and then you input your package name there so you input raster there and then you can install and you can also use code that is install.packages and then followed by the package name. Yes, you'll run this 